In our last review video, we actually did the hardest part of chromosomal inheritance, and we talked about the idea of gene linkage and the structure of the chromosomes and the advancements that were done early in the 20th century in our understanding of chromosomes. In this video, we're going to talk about a little more detail about some other things that have to do with inheritance patterns, some of them which were also discovered by Stuart Vaught, including sex linkage. But before we do that, let's think about the advantage of actually having chromosomes. Why chromosome in the first place? Why did life actually evolve this whole packaging of DNA into actual groups of more, or one linear molecule and then you have many of these inside the actual nucleus. Well, the advantage is that you actually increase variation because since you're going to have crossing over happening between chromosomes and you're going to have independent assortment of chromosomes, that actually increases variation during meiosis. If you only had one chromosome, there would be no point for crossing over or for independent assortment and so there would be less variety. Also, chromosomes that help us determine what a species actually is. If you have a different carrier type, in other words, you have a different set of chromosomes, you can't really reproduce with another species. Because if you put 23 pairs on a, and you get them in half, you're only going to have 23 chromosomes in a gamete. But if you do that with another species that only has 22 two chromosomes in a gamete, you're going to have a nuclei happening when you actually combine them. And then the same thing happens with the integrity of the DNA and it limits the size of the DNA so it's actually easier to manage it and copy the DNA doing uh, the, the cell division process. And so chromosomes are good for life for those reasons. Now another thing that actually was worked by Thomas on Morgan is the idea of sex linkage. And before we do that, understand that sex determination is having everything to do with, that, with the sex chromosomes. In some animals, you have 22 autosomes, for example, humans, and then you have a last pair of chromosomes that determines your gender. If you have a Y, you're a male. If you have an XX, you're a female. And that's the way it is for humans, for example. But other animals have different ways of determining gender. For example, the XO system is slightly different in some insects. And that's when the male doesn't really have the Y. It just doesn't have two X's. So only one X equals male. They're barely different in that case. The ZW system is when you have an actual completely different set of chromosomes and you, on, on the male than you have the female. And then you have the haploid system like the bees that females are diploid and they can reproduce and males are haploid. And so you see the different kinds of sex determination. In humans, of course, you have the X and the Y chromosome. The X chromosome is much larger than the Y chromosome. Look at that. The X chromosome is actually almost three, four times the volume of the Y chromosome. All the Y chromosome is really worried about is creating maleness or creating secondary male correct characteristics which come from the production of testosterone which starts very early in the embryonic process, which at first they all start with female-like, but as the testosterone from the Y chromosome kicks in, it turns the actual baby into a male. Now, that means that the gender determination has something to do with this. In humans, the homogametic sex is the sex that has two chromosomes which are the same, where XX, and those are the females. The heterogametic sex, it has two different kinds of chromosomes, or XY, and that will be the males. But notice that males will be hemizygous for genes in the X chromosome, because they only have one X chromosome. So whatever information is stored in the X chromosome, the Y chromosome says nothing about it. And therefore, instead of having big A, little A, the, norm, the way it normally is, males are going to be hemizygous or have only one allele for traits which are carried by the X chromosome, which makes them more likely to be presenting with diseases carried by the X chromosome or sex-linked diseases, while females are going to be more likely to be carriers than actually show the disease since they have a second X chromosome to protect them from those situations. By the way, remember that you can also end up with a hemizygous trait if you actually have something like a deletion or non-disjunction which make you miss a piece of or, or an entire chromosome. Thomas Hunt Morgan discovered the idea of sex linkage by studying the eye color of the zoophilia flies and noticing a specific pattern or, or in which it was more likely for females to have a red eye color than to have a white eye color and that white color was more common in males than females. And we, I do this in a little more detail in another video, but basically that's kind of how he figured out that there was such a thing as called sex linkage. Because clearly the gene for eye color was carried by the X chromosome and that was making it more likely for males to share the trait of having the white abnormal eye color than the females. Here you see a few examples of the sex linkage patterns that I discussed in a little more length in the actual videos where I enter detail about this stuff. But see for example if you have a female on item A which is a carrier of the disease 
which is normal and does not have the genes, and then a male which actually presents with a disease, only the females will be carriers and the males will be normal since they inherit the X chromosome from their mothers. The Y chromosome they obviously inherited from their, from their dad, otherwise they wouldn't be male. All right? If they had inherited an X from their dad, they will be females. And either way, the females will not have the disease. They will be carriers because they will receive a, a good chromosome from their mothers since their mother is going to be normal. And the case where you have a mother that's a carrier and a male that is normal, then in that case, if the you, males receive the bad X from their mother, they're going to have the disease. And if the females receive the bad X from their mother, they're going to be carriers since they're going to receive a good uh, X from their dads. And they have to receive that. If they receive the Y, they will be males. And in that case, they will be normal as well. So you see how, again, uh, you see this different kind of pattern of males and females. And on this third example here, when you have the female that's a carrier and a male that actually presents with the disease, then you're going to have a male that has the disease, a female that has a disease, and a female that's a carrier. But when you look at the overall pattern here, males are more likely to have the disease than not, and males are more likely to present with the disease than to be carriers, while females are more likely to not have the disease and to be carriers than actually present with the disease. And there's always a bigger chance for males to have it than for females to have it. And this is all because because this particular trait that we're talking about here, like hemophilia or color blindness or Duchenne muscular dystrophy, are all caused by diseases carried within the X chromosome. Another thing that has to do with sex chromosomes is the idea of X chromosome inactivation. In females, when you have two X chromosomes, one chromosome is always deactivated, or the X chromosome, and that is called the bar body. It's kind of like a crumbled up chromosome that actually doesn't actually have any function, or at least we thought it didn't. That means that the females are not necessarily double X, they're actually single X. And depending on which X is active, you're going to have a different look. Look at the cat example that they're giving you here to understand what that means. So a female, for example, that carries the hemophilic gene in one of its X chromosomes might be hemophilic if the X chromosome that gets deactivated is the one that is actually the good one. The bad one is active will cause the female to be hemophilic. But the bar body must actually have a function because if it didn't, diseases like Kleinfelter syndrome and Turner syndrome will not cause problems. And we'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit. Another interesting pattern that has, that has to do with, with sex determination is that sometimes genes are inherited differently depending on whether you receive it from mother or from the dad. For example, if you receive a deletion on the IGF2 chromosome of mice, and if they receive that from a mother, they would actually make the mice be a giant. But if you receive the same deletion in a father gene, then that means that the mice is going to be a dwarf. Or look the way, for example, that males and females are in, are in the characteristics of the manes of lions and tigers are going to be different if they receive it from a female or if they receive it from a male. And so these are examples of what we call genomic imprinting, or the idea that if you receive a gene from mom, sometimes it's going to be act different if you receive the mom gene from dad. And this has everything to do with the presence of testosterone in the male, which is going to affect the expression of that gene. Another interesting point that has to do with inheritance is the idea of dominance versus recessiveness. First of all, it's good, important to remember that dominant traits are not necessarily better than their recessive traits. The only reason they are their dominant is because they're chemically more intense than the recessive trait. But it does not necessarily mean a good thing. Some dominant disorders will cause problems, like dwarfism, Huntington's disease, and so many other deformity diseases which are dominant related. And that means that dominance does not necessarily mean better. Evolutionary uh, characteristics of a trait are separate from the actual genetic relationship that of the trait. Sometimes dominant traits are worse than recessive traits. And there's a lots of things which are recessive, but they're more common because they're actually better for you than having the dominant trait. Recessive only means it's actually going to be less likely to show up if the dominant trait gene is around. Well, that's all. Now, this is also going to affect the way that these traits are being passed on. And the better way to show this is to doing pedigrees. Remember, pedigrees will show you how traits are passed on across generations, where squares will mean males, circles will mean females, and shadedness means having the trait. Sometimes they also have different symbols for carriers. That's actually shown in this particular pedigree here. In this pedigree, you actually see the dominant trait. Why? Because you see that the trait is not skipping generations. It's being carried more often than a recessive trait. And it's because, for example, window speak is determined by a dominant relationship where if you are hybrid, you also show the trait. 
in this pedigree is going to be a recessive trait. And the characteristic of the recessive trait is that it can skip generations. Notice how the parents over here do not have the trait, and yet the children can actually show up with the trait. And the same pattern repeats itself here. Parents without it can make a child with it. This is a characteristic of a recessive pedigree. It can skip generations. And sometimes it's going to be less likely to show up because it's a recessive trait. But remember, not necessarily. It's going to depend on whether or not it's going to be beneficial or deleterious to have that trait. Some other kinds of pedigree patterns include the idea of, of autosomal versus sex link in a pedigree. When a trait is autosomal, you will see no difference between male and females having or not having the trait. But when a trait is sex linked, like the pedigree that's shown in red there, you see that it's more common for males to actually have it than females. Females are more likely to be carriers, represented by the half shadiness. And that means that uh, it's going to be a, a sex link trait, which is what we talked about earlier in this video. Another thing that's actually also is going to be confusing in some pedigrees is the idea that it's possible for you to have dominant traits which are less common in the pedigree, like the one you see in the top right. It is a dominant trait because it never skips generations, but it's less common than a recessive trait. Why? Because that is a, a hypercholesterolemia, which is a dominant trait which causes problems, and therefore it's going to be less common in the population because it most likely it will cause people not to actually procreate if they have the problem. Another strange pattern is the idea of incomplete penetrance, which is possible to have a dominant trait that does not show up in a certain generation, which makes it look like it's a recessive trait, as you see here. It's skipped a generation, but it's not skipping generation because it's a recessive trait. It's a skipping a generation because it, the, the environment made that trait not show up. For example, depression is has some genetic components, but sometimes the children of depressed parents are not depressed themselves because they were raised in environments that actually protect them from having the depression. And the only way you can tell the difference between an incomplete penetrance pedigree and a recessive pedigree is if you track it across many generations. Eventually, you're going to see a dominant trait show, pattern show up where it doesn't skip generations. Another kind of strange pedigree is the idea of mitochondrial inheritance, where the trait that the father has does not matter. Only what the mother has matters. Notice that whenever the mother has the trait, then the, the, the kids have the trait. Whenever the mother doesn't have the trait, even if the dad has the trait, then the kids don't have the, the trait. So that means that the trait is what determines the children. What's going on there? Well, that has to do with the fact that mitochondria, chloroplast, and plasmids are organelles that have their own DNA. So for example, mitochondria carries their own protein synthesis factory. It, it, it carries its own genetic material. And since the sperm, only thing that goes inside of it is the DNA that goes inside the egg, all your mitochondria is inherited from your mothers, which means that we receive all our mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. It means if there's a problem in the mitochondrial DNA causing a mutation, only the mother is going to matter. The father is not going to matter. And you can actually use this to trace evolutionary history of the new human race to identify that there's in fact very close similarities in mitochondrial DNA which is actually more stable than nuclear DNA since it doesn't do that whole crossing over in independent absorbing business it doesn't actually follow Mendelian laws of inheritance because they're, they're not involved in meiosis and they're not involved in mitosis this is a different kind of inheritance pattern and you can track these things to actually see uh, how the, the species is changing across time or do something that's called molecular clocking all right and remember this is going to be true for mitochondria which is found in all your karyotes chloroplasts which is found in a lot of protists and plants and plasmids which found in bacteria and in some plants as well